Disorder Wellness Session. I am Dr. Betty Rodriguez Rubio. I'm a registered psychologist, and with me are Dr. Ashley Hayes, who is also a psychologist, and Jennifer Burton, who is a registered clinical dietitian. And now we're going to start. So the purpose of this wellness session is to provide education on what is binge eating, as well as on what contributes and maintains it. In other words, why you can't just snap out of it. We also aim to provide you with some skills and resources that can interrupt the binge cycle. We will also give you some information on change and on how to start changing your behavior and why change is so hard. And we aim to provide a safe and supportive environment for you to reflect uh, on your binge eating and to try and decrease the feelings of shame that many times um, stop us from seeking help. It is really important to note that this wellness session is in no way intended for you to diagnose yourself. If you feel like you require further assessment or further help, please make an appointment with a mental health care provider. So we have some tips for getting the most out of this webinar. So the first thing is to give yourself time to reflect on the questions and exercises presented. Also, feel free to pause this webinar as much as you need so that you can have some time to reflect on the questions. We also recommend for you to have some things handy. The first is pen and paper to reflect on the questions and also one craisin or one baby carrot or a raisin or any other small food item. I have craisins myself, so it's dried raisins, not, not dried raisins, dried cranberries. So we are going to define what a binge eating episode is. And this is not overeating. In, in a few slides, I will talk about the difference between overeating and binge eating. So a binge eating episode is eating in a discrete period of time, an amount of food that is definitely larger than most people would eat in a similar period of time under similar circumstances. What is binge eating disorder according to the DSM-5? So for those of you who don't know that DSM-5 is the diagnostic um, statistical manual uh, that we use as psychologists to diagnose. Um, so according to the DSM, uh, Binge eating disorder is characterized by recurrent episodes of binging that have both of the following. Eating an objectively large amount of food, more than most people would eat in a limited period of time, a sense of lack of control, and the binge is associated with one or more of the following. Eating more rapidly than normal, feeling uncomfortably full, eating large amounts of food even when you're not physically hungry, eating alone because you feel really embarrassed, feeling disgusted with yourself, depressed or guilty afterwards. There are also feelings of distress or impairment regarding the binge eating. The binges occur at least once a week for at least three months, and the binge is not associated with regular inappropriate overcompensatory behavior as in bulimia nervosa and does not occur exclusively during the course of bulimia or anorexia nervosa. So there are some differences between binge eating disorder and overeating. So overeating can be a tendency for many people. We can all do it, you know, having an extra helping at a meal, even when we're already full, or eating beyond like feeling full on a special holiday meal or celebratory occasion. So this is very, very um, common during Christmas, Thanksgiving. You know, we can just eat a little bit too much because it's delicious. Uh, overeating also is mostly an occasional happening. In contrast, in binge eating disorder, binges happen at least once a week for at least three months. And while overeating may occur periodically in a person without this disorder, an individual with binge eating disorder has recurrent episodes of binging without purging, often leading to both emotional and physical distress. 
another difference is the feeling of lack of control. When we overeat, we are still in control and feel like we are making a choice. During the course of binge eating disorder, people feel an intense lack of control. So basically, you feel like you cannot stop eating. Also, we can overeat in public. So when we go out to restaurants or at family gatherings, we can overeat because it's so good, the food, and, and it's fine. In contrast, people who struggle with binge eating disorder typically experience feelings of disgust, guilt, or embarrassment, and binge eat in isolation to conceal this behavior. So a lot of the time, it's like literally setting some time apart to actually binge eat when you're alone so that you don't feel that embarrassed. Um, so now I am going to pass over to Ashley, who will talk about what contributes to binge eating disorder. Um. Okay, so as Betty said, uh, my name is Dr. Ashley Hayes. I'm a psychologist with Eastern Health. So I'm going to talk now about what contributes to binge eating disorder. So there are a range of both physiological, so physical and psychological factors that may contribute to a binge or to binge eating disorder. So the first thing is physical conditions. Uh, so conditions that are actually in your body. And I'll talk about all of these in more detail as we go through. Frequency of eating or how often you eat. Your relationship with food your relationship with yourself and your body, and your emotions or feelings. So let's talk first about physical conditions. Sometimes there may be an issue happening at the physiological level that can impact your appetite. So for example, you might be taking a medication that increases your appetite, um, or you might have thyroid issues. Um, so these are physical conditions that can be happening that can lead to an increase in appetite. Um, so it can be beneficial if you're experiencing symptoms of binge eating disorder to speak to a medical doctor to rule out any physiological issues first. Another, um, another in, a part that impacts on binge eating disorder is how often you eat. So the body struggles when it doesn't receive enough food for significant periods of time, or uh, if there is a restriction of food over a particular amount of time. So for example, uh, if a person doesn't eat breakfast or skips lunch, uh, by the time the evening comes, their body is just desperate for food and you might feel um, really intense cravings for food, um, which then puts them more at risk of a binge. Um, and so it might be helpful for you uh, to think of your eating schedule. So do you think you could be waiting too long between meals or snacks? Um, and you can pause this webinar, as Betty mentioned, to think about that or think about what your eating schedule has even been over the past couple of days. So another factor um, is your relationship with food. So what does this mean? So as humans, our relationship with food is a bit complicated. So unlike most other species, we don't only eat to survive. Um, there's many rituals and meanings uh, in every culture around food. So for example, uh, a lot of important holidays involve eating together, thinking of Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthdays, almost any special occasion is going to involve uh, potentially having dinner or eating with others. Whenever we're happy or celebrating, we usually go out for food and drinks. 
For some of us, if we're sad or heartbroken and need comfort, we'll eat something. So think about probably every romantic comedy you've ever seen when the person uh, reaches for ice cream as soon as something goes wrong in their romantic relationship or as soon as there is a breakup. Um, social situations in general um, involve food a lot of times. If we're bored, sometimes we'll distract ourselves with eating, thinking about uh, eating popcorn uh, in front of the TV or in front of a movie. Um, and exactly, so there's other rituals around food um, that we might have transformed into habit for ourselves. So from these experiences, from our own experiences, we develop a complex web of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that all relate to food. And so perhaps you can think of your own relationship with food. Has it changed since you were little? Um, and also what were the messages you've received from your family about food? So you can take a moment to reflect on this as well. So the next piece is your relationship with yourself and your body. So how a person feels about themselves and their body can impact their relationship with food. It's not unusual for people who have struggles with food to also have struggles with their self and body esteem. And again, perhaps reflect on your own relationship and body. How does this impact your relationship with food? Because this is going to be very different um, for everybody. So the last piece that we'll talk about, and this list is certainly not exhaustive, uh, is emotions. So it's really common for binge eating episodes or binge eating disorder um, to also involve struggles with depression and or anxiety or other types of uh, mental distress. Binging can be a way of soothing or distracting from emotions. Um, it can, in the short term, help us distract or soothe sadness, anger, boredom, or a number of other really uncomfortable emotions. So the problem is, though, that binging generally also generates other emotions. So, for example, after a binge, people often feel guilt and shame, which can then lead to having another binge. And so in the next slide, I'm going to put all of this together and talk about the binge cycle. So the vicious cycle of binge eating um, is developed by a researcher named Fairburn. And I'm gonna bring in all of the pieces we just talked about. So the cycle of binge eating uh, is often then followed by guilt, shame, and frustration, um, which then leads to more binge eating. So this is a very simple kind of version. And then we start to bring in all of these factors which can vary on any given day. So like we learned about already, emotions can impact this cycle. So if we're already experiencing a low mood or we're sad about something, um, I might be more likely to binge eat. Uh, situations on that particular day can also impact this cycle. So um, if I've experienced a conflict with somebody, I might be more likely to binge eat. Um, your relationship with your body. So if I'm experiencing low body esteem, if I'm feeling, you know, having thoughts like I'm really fat, for example, then I might be more likely to feel guilt and shame and then more likely to binge eat. Uh, other thoughts. So um, planning to do better. Uh, putting a lot of pressure on yourself or being consumed by thoughts of food or dieting can also uh, lead to feelings of guilt and shame, frustration, and then binge eating. Um, food intake also impacts um, this cycle. So again, if I had skipped breakfast and lunch and it's now supper time, then I'm really, really hungry and probably more likely to engage in binge eating than I would be if I wasn't so hungry or if I hadn't skipped those meals. And then physical vulnerabilities can also impact um, our likelihood of binge eating. So am I tired? Do I feel sick? Even something like a cold or chronic pain or an injury can all impact uh, likelihood of binge eating. 
um, or these emotions that contribute to it. So I really encourage you to pause the webinar and take a few minutes to jot down some of the factors that make you more vulnerable to binge eating episodes. Um, by increasing awareness of this, it really helps you plan ahead with coping strategies, um, which we're going to talk about next. So now I'm going to be passing the mic over to Jennifer Burton, our dietitian, who's going to talk about some strategies to help you move towards change. Hi there, this is Jennifer Burton here. Um, so one of the strategies to um, aid um, someone who is experiencing binge eating is to look um, at the nutritional piece and try to find out, um, you know, are there any patterns in your day-to-day -day living that may be contributing to um, binge eating? Um, because generally, if the body uh, doesn't have the food it needs, um, bear with me, sorry. It uh, gets confused as to when um, it will get the resources it needs. One way to look at this is to um, keep a food diary to help uh, figure out your starting point. So for example, in a couple of slides, I'm going to actually provide you with an example of a self-reporting form. And a lot of people find that ben very beneficial to really start looking at um, their overall patterns, eating ha habits, and how uh, certain foods make you feel when you are actually um, consuming them. So some things uh, that the food diary may help you um, look at. Um, are you eating regularly? Like Ashley said, sometimes some people um, aren't eating their three meals a day or are cutting out um, snacks or um, only eat two meals a day. So um, when you start to do the uh, self-reporting form, you may notice some trends um, that you are engaging in from day to day that can help you. Um, along. So a good way um, to do this is um, to really look at what you're doing from day to day is to consult with Canada's Food Guide and a dietitian can help you with that or also um, on Health Canada's website. There's uh, Canada's Food Guide has a new website now um, where you can kind of get some little tips and um, um, recipes and those types of things. So next, our next slide, we're going to look at um, the food guide itself. Um, so I apologize for the busyness. Um, so this is the newest um, Canada's food guide. So in the center of the screen, um, you can see basically a plate. OK, so you have uh, so if you look on the left hand side of the food guide, um, you can see uh, the half of your plate should basically be uh, a variety of fruits and vegetables. Uh, and it doesn't mean, OK, yeah, I'm going to have vegetables for breakfast along with fruit, et cetera, et cetera. It's just, you know, it's important to uh, choose a variety there. Uh, and they're important part of uh, a healthy eating pattern. Um, and eating a variety of fruits and vegetables can also lower your risk of heart disease and other um, health related issues. So if you, um, your intake is generally low in fruits and vegetables, this could be some, a place to start, okay? And, or maybe if you haven't tried a new veggie, that might be something that you can try. 
Um, so um, maybe even if you could make uh, half your plate vegetables and fruit like broccoli, carrots, blueberries, strawberries, peppers, etc. Um, they're great fillers. They're high in fiber and they're very, very nutritious. Um, and then uh, the general recommendation too is to choose more whole or cut vegetables rather than can vegetables where you uh, as often as you can or frozen um, and then fruits more than juice even frozen fruit um, would be a good choice on the right hand side of your plate um, would be the core on the top right hand corner would be your protein foods so one quarter of your plate should be your protein foods such as lean meat chicken, nuts, seeds, lentils, eggs, tofu, yogurt, fish, and beans. So there's a, there's a change in this food guide compared to the older food guide uh, where dairy had its own group. Um, however, so they've got yogurt, milk, that sort of thing included in the protein group now. Um, so some of the great choices, um, could be you know your almonds your cashews your nut butter sunflower seeds um, peanuts eggs is a great high protein source uh, and the general recommendation is to try to choose if you're going to have beef pork wild game that sort of thing choose some leaner cuts um, and same thing with turkey and chicken so technically speaking your plate should only consist of the quarter um, quarter of your plate should be protein foods, okay? Some other good choices would be uh, fish and shellfish, the fatty fish, trout, shrimp, salmon, scallops, sardines and mackerel if you like them. Um, and then the lower fat dairy products are also very, very good for you. Milk, uh, lower sodium, lower fat cheeses, yogurts, those types of things. Another thing um, that would be really great to introduce into your diet, which are very high in fiber, high in protein, would be your beans, peas, and lentils. So, uh, and explore maybe some uh, new ways of eating these foods. Um, another thing would be that's in your protein group would be your fortified, fortified soy beverages, tofu, soybeans, and other soy products. Um, so, on the, so that's your protein foods. Uh, next is your greens. So that's the lower right hand corner of your food guide. Um, and we generally recommend that you have um, choose your whole grain foods more often um, because they're higher in fiber. Refined grains um, tend to uh, be higher in available sugar um, and they don't fill you up quite as, as, as quickly and as, as your whole grains. Um, so they basically refine grains, remove part of the grain during processing. So whole grains have more fiber and they also can lower your risk of some health related problems like stroke, um, bowel cancer, colon cancer heart disease and type two diabetes. And people with binge eating disorder who've been living with this for a while are generally more at risk of, of developing some of these issues. So if you look at this food guide and if there's something, once you start recording your intake on the food log, which I'll show you in a couple uh, more slides, you can really say, okay, pick it one little bit, one little meal at a time, a snack at a time, and say, okay, I'm going to make some healthier choices for my overall health. On this food guide, um, on the top right-hand uh, corner, it says make water your drink of choice. It's not to say that you can't drink other things other things, but generally a lot of people um, aren't consuming enough fluids in the run of a day. So that's another thing that you can also um, improve on if, you're, if your overall fluid intake is quite low. Um, and also too, water can help your body digest the other, th other foods, especially if you're starting to have a little extra fiber in your diet, the water is always really good. Um, so, but also too, one thing that's not mentioned in this food guide, particularly on the front, is your fats. Um, so when you're preparing your food or even just toast, that sort of thing, it's important to in include some healthy fats in your diet. 
So nuts are also, nuts and seeds are also a form of fat, avocado, soft margarine, and oils such as corn, olive, canola, peanut, sesame, soybean, flaxseed, safflower, and sunflower are also very good choices. So basically, um, if you start recording your overall intake and you recognize, okay, yeah, my fruits and veggies are quite low, or I'm eating larger portions of um, peanut butter per se, um, it might be a good idea to say, okay, well, what can I do to take one step at a time um, to help improve this? So to basically recap, um, eating well is, can also help you live well. Um, so if you notice that your, your um, routine, um, if you only eat one to two meals per day, like Ashley said earlier, it might be important to start, you know, having your three meals per day. Uh, another thing I notice oftentimes people who um, have been diagnosed with binge eating disorder a lot of times are thinking well I have to be good earlier in the day and you're trying to optimize you know trying to um, not overdo it in the morning just to try to delay the binge eating that sort of thing um, but in actual fact by optimizing your nutrition earlier in the day can actually help reduce your binge eating later the amount um, volume frequency that sort of thing and like i said in the previous slide if you're not balancing your meals currently it might be something you might want to try so include the variety there um, your fruits and veggies your protein foods and your grain Another thing that really, once you start delving into um, your nutrition and, um, you know, hopefully um, making some um, changes, um, is planning your meals in advance. It not only helps cut the cost of your, um, you know, sometimes can actually um, prevent you from grabbing last minute things, um, planning your meals in advance and cooking more often and cooking with ones that are friends, family, that sort of thing. Using food labels where possible. Um, as I said before, um, they're, um, we generally recommend lower fat um, foods such as dairy, cheeses, you know, milk, cheese, yogurt, that sort of thing. So that's often beneficial too. And um, and a dietitian can help with this. So if you um, have been diagnosed with binge eating disorder or suspect that you do, it, you could always visit your uh, medical doctor and ask for a referral um, to a dietitian and they can help you with that. So this is um, the self-reporting, self-monitoring form. Um, which can a lot of people find it this um, very beneficial um, one um, to kind of have a little look at the times that you're eating um, and the, the amounts, uh, what it is you're choosing at breakfast, where are you eating these things, that sort of thing, and um, how did it make you feel? Uh, that can be tricky for a lot of people. Um, however, you can start to notice particular settings that may be triggering for you or particular foods that may be causing issues. And another thing too um, is, you know, are there certain times that your binges are happening, certain locations that your binges are happening? And when you're actually using the self-reporting form, self-monitoring form, if you have um, healthcare providers that you're currently seeing, um, you know, they can help you um, look at these patterns as well. But it's also a very useful tool for you to use on your own and really start identifying some trends or some positive um, changes that you're making. And on the bottom um, is like if you've exercised, what have you done and what type? So I'm going to pass um, the um, presentation back over to Betty. Uh-huh. Here we go. Hi. So this is Dr. Betty again. Um, 
So now we're going to talk about, you know, after seeing all the things that you can do in terms of being able to know what to eat that Jennifer was mentioning, which is so important. Now we're going to reflect on how, how we think impacts our relationship with food. Because many times we might have a range of thoughts, food, so, or about, so for instance, with food, you know, sometimes we're obsessing about food, thinking about food all the time, uh, labeling food as good or bad, which is very common. You, we may also have a range of thoughts about ourselves. For instance, our ideas of self-worth. Um, for example, if you only feel worthy, if you are a certain weight or size, we might also have uh, a range of thoughts about, about our body. So ideas about the ideal shape or size. And there is hope, guys. We can manage these thoughts using different frameworks and different strategies. So the first framework I am going to talk about is cognitive behavioral therapy. The next is acceptance and commitment therapy. We'll talk about diffusion. And finally, we're going to talk about mindfulness. And we're going to do a little exercise for each of them. So with cognitive behavioral therapy, basically what CBT says is that what we think can have an impact on how we feel and how we act. So for example, the situation, I overate. So I can go in two different directions. The first one is I think, oh my God, I've blown it now which will lead to feelings of sadness, shame, or guilt. And this can lead to behaviors of behaviors and actions. So for instance, we stay in bed and we feel so, give me a second. We stay in bed and we feel so much shame and I say, you know what, I'm never going to overeat again. Of course, the next time uh, that I feel badly, we might, I might overeat anyway. Um, but look at what happens when the same situation, I overeat, uh, but I have different thoughts about it. So the thought is, oh, that was a lapse, but tomorrow is a new day. So, you know, we might feel a little bit of self-compassion, self-kindness, it's a bit more relaxed. And our behaviors might be to, you know, feel okay, engage in self-forgiveness, go out for a walk, talk to friends, and then guess what? It is less likely that I'll overeat next time. The main uh, framework of CBT is to encourage you to try and change your, to challenge and change your thoughts. This does not mean that we have to be thinking super positive about everything, but rather we're moving the thoughts to something more realistic and less destructive, right? So it's not about positive thinking, it's about thinking with a little bit more kindness and compassion and challenging our thoughts. Right, because if we if I overeat at breakfast, well, that doesn't mean I just I ruined my whole day. It can just mean that you know what I overeat right now. That's fine. I'll do better later. I'll do better tomorrow. And now we're going to watch a little uh, fun video. Uh, this is based on acceptance and commitment therapy, because another way of navigating thoughts is to change the relationship we have with thought with the thoughts, or to ch change the power that thoughts have over us. And this is called diffusion. So we are going to watch a super cute video. Oops, oh no, sorry. Oh. Okay, we're doing it again, sorry guys. Thank you. 
So the cool thing about noticing our thoughts while holding them lightly is that, you know, when I think, oh my God, I'm stupid, I can take it as true. But when I say, you know what, I am having the thought that I'm stupid, it puts a bit of distance between us and the thought. And when we say, oh, I am noticing, I am having the thought that I'm stupid, it puts even more distance. So this distance allows us to have space to then feel a bit different or act in a different way. So it, it opens up the space to think and act in different ways. Oh, there we go. So now we're going to talk about mindfulness. So what is mindfulness? Okay, somehow I got muted, but now I am unmuted, so we can go on and talk about mindfulness. So mindfulness is defined as the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So what, how would mindfulness be helpful for binge eating, you ask? Well, uh, when we talk about what binge eating is, we notice that during a binge, uh, eating tends to be very, very fast and there is a perceived lack of control. So when we're mindful, we tend to slow things down. During a binge, a person is not in the present moment and mindfulness involves being in the present moment. This does not mean that you are not thinking or feeling, but rather that, so when, when you're mindful, it, it doesn't mean that you're not thinking or feeling, rather it means that you're having thoughts and feelings, noticing the thoughts and feelings and returning to the present moment. It also means that you are slowing down, you're paying attention on purpose and in a non-judgmental way. So that can help with the feelings of shame. Mindfulness has also been demonstrated to be a very helpful intervention for binge eating. And now we're going to practice. So what I'm going to ask you to do now for the mindful eating is to please get your small food item. And we will use this item for the following practice. I am using a craisin, so I will um, talk about the crazy, but you can use any food item you feel like using. Um, are you ready? Okay, so let's do it. So first you're gonna have, you're gonna take a really comfortable seat, feeling yourself on the chair, maybe closing your eyes for a moment, and you're going to inhale, and exhale, and inhale, and pause, exhale, and pause, and inhale, pause, 
and exhale and pause. And now breathing at your own rhythm, maybe trying to breathe a little bit slower than you would normally. Allowing yourself to feel really present in this moment. And when you're ready, take your praise in or small food item and open your eyes and just bring your attention to this tiny piece of food. Perhaps think of the journey it must have taken to get to your hands, how it was lovingly grown with sunshine and water, and then transported all the way to where you are. Think about the journey this little crazy took to get to you. And now you're going to look at this crazy and observe its texture, if, it, if the light shines on it, if it's a little bit wrinkly, just take it all in. Maybe imagine that this is the first time that you see a crazy. Really explore it. And now, with all your awareness, smell the crazy. Mm, notice how that feels. And now with full awareness, place the craisin in your mouth without chewing or swallowing, just allowing it to be in your mouth. Maybe roll it, roll it around to different parts of your mouth and your tongue. Notice the flavor, notice the texture. Maybe give it a little bite and see and notice how the flavor expands through your mouth. Notice the change of texture. Notice how it all feels in your mouth. Chew it a bit. Don't swallow it just yet. Just really be present with the taste. And when you're ready, you can swallow. And just notice how it changes, what kind of flavors were left in your mouth. Connect with your body and your breath to notice your experience in this moment. And now close your eyes for just a moment, one more time. And now take three slow, deep breaths, maybe exhaling first. And when you're ready, open your eyes. So how was that for you? Was there anything surprising about the exercise? What did you notice? What did you learn? Maybe give yourself a moment to reflect, get your pen and paper and see how that went. Because you know, one of the things you can do is whenever you feel like you want to binge eat, this is a wonderful exercise to actually do, to actually eat in a more present, focused, non-judgmental way. So now we are going to talk about feelings and I am going to give this to Ashley one more time. Mm -mm. 
Okay, so uh, you're back with Ashley now. I'm going to be with you for the rest of the presentation today. Um, so now I'm going to talk about feelings or emotions. So feelings or emotions can often contribute to urges to binge eat. We talked about this earlier, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what we can do about that, what we can do uh, to help with um, dealing with really strong, uh, uncomfortable emotions. So learning to identify our feelings can help us figure out ways to take care of ourselves. So if we don't know at all what we're feeling or we're really disconnected from the sensations of feelings in our bodies, which often uh, we can be, um, then it's really difficult to figure out how to take care of ourselves because after all, emotions do give us information about what we need. Um, so sadness, even though it can be really uncomfortable, actually signals a need to connect with others or that we need to self-soothe. Um, so if you don't know what self-soothing is, don't worry, we're going to talk about that and exactly how to do that in um, one of the upcoming slides. Anger, for example, again, often experienced as a really uncomfortable or quote unquote bad emotion, actually signals a need to set a boundary. So for example, um, if someone has um, done something to hurt you or you know, in a really extreme case has maybe called you a name or something like that uh, and you feel angry, that actually might signal a need um, to set a boundary with them to let them know that that's not okay. So paying attention to our emotions uh, can actually help us figure out if certain situations in our lives are working for us or not working for us. Um, so Betty just introduced us to mindfulness um, and we can also take this skill and help us use it to help us improve our skill at identifying an emotion. Um, often binge eating is used to uh, sort of distract um, or numb out from an emotion. So we're going to uh, work on how we can reconnect with our emotions a little bit at a time. Um, we can also use self-soothing and self-compassion to address sadness or other challenging emotions. So we don't just need to uh, notice them and then sit with that. We can actually use tools um, to help us kind of deal with them or um, change those emotions a little bit or make them less intense. So um, I'm now going to lead you through um, another exercise that's going to combine a little bit of mindfulness of your emotion to help you notice what you're feeling um, and also some self-compassion. So for this exercise, again, I'm going to invite you to first either close your eyes or if that's not comfortable, um, lower your eyes and pick a point on the floor or uh, on, in front of you somewhere that you can focus on throughout this exercise so you're not sort of looking all over the place um, while you practice this exercise with me. I'm also going to ask you to get comfortable in your chair in such a way that you can uh, feel comfortable yet alert during the exercise um, and to be rather still. It's okay if you move a bit. We want to kind of cultivate some stillness right now. So first of all, I want you to bring to mind a situation in your life that's difficult. So not the most difficult situation in your life, but maybe something that happened over the last little bit over the past week or so um, that caused you a little bit of distress. This could be a conflict with someone, um, a small argument, uh, something that happened at work or in another place in your life that led to an uncomfortable emotion. So I really want you to bring this situation to mind. Think of where you were, who was there, what was happening, and really pay attention to what sort of emotion is coming up, what sort of feeling is coming up for you right now. And I want you to look into your body and notice what kinds of sensations are coming up. And if your mind drifts back to your thoughts, just bring it back to your body and what sorts of sensations or feelings are there. And there might be lots of different sensations. You can kind of take a small scan from head to toe and notice what feels the strongest right now. So you might notice, for example, a tightness in your chest, um, could be a heaviness or a different feeling somewhere else, but there's probably something coming up for you. 
And I want you to just notice this sensation for a moment. Notice where it starts and where it ends. And try to be like an explorer who's very curious about learning as much as they can about this emotion. If you had to draw a line around the sensation, what would it look like? Is it on the surface of your body or inside of you? Where is the sensation most intense? Um, would it have a color or a temperature? Is it moving or still? So once you have it, I just want you to continue paying attention to that, that sensation, that emotion as it exists in your body. And then I want you to say to yourself, the first component of self-compassion, which is actually mindfulness of the emotion. So you might say something to yourself like, this is a moment of suffering. Um, if that doesn't feel right to you, other options might be like, this hurts, or ouch, or this is stress, or this is sadness, or just naming that emotion. So really saying to yourself in your head or out loud, some sort of uh, description of that emotion. So whether it be suffering or this hurts or what, whatever it is that works for you. And then the next piece that we're gonna move to is you're gonna say to yourself, suffering is a part of life. This is the common humanity component. So in other words, realizing that you're not alone in having this feeling that it's very human to feel whatever suffering or pain you're feeling right now. Um, other options to express this might include other people feel this way, I'm not alone, or we all struggle in our lives. So take a moment to uh, send that message to yourself. And now when you're ready, I want you to put your hand over your heart, or you can put both hands over your heart on your chest, and feel the warmth of your hands and the gentle touch of your hands on your chest or adopt the soothing touch that you might have discovered it feels right for you. So you could give yourself a hug, um, whatever it is that works for you. And then I want you to gently say to yourself, this is the kindness part, may I be kind to myself? You could also ask yourself, what do I need to hear right now to express kindness to myself? Are there phrases that speak to you in a particular situation or something that someone very close to you has said in the past? So you may say, may I give myself compassion that I need? May I learn to accept myself as I am? May I forgive myself? May I be strong? May I be patient? Or anything else that speaks to you. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes and bring your attention back to the room. And this is a practice that can be used anytime and if you notice something com uncomfortable coming up, and it will help you to remember to invoke those three aspects of self-compassion, which are mindfulness, common humanity, and self-kindness. So take a moment uh, to reflect on what came up for you, uh, what you noticed, what kinds of emotions you had while you were doing this. Um, although it's a very kind exercise, it is normal for it to bring up difficult feelings if we've spent a long time not being kind to ourselves or being more critical to ourselves. So if you need to take a moment, by all means, uh, pause this webinar while you kind of reflect on that, maybe even write out a few um, thoughts. Okay. So now we're gonna move on to self-soothing. So this is another tool that you can use when you're having difficult emotions. So I put all the information on the slide, so it's gonna get quite full as I go through this. So self-soothing has to do with comforting, nurturing, and being kind to yourself. So one way to think of this is to think of ways of soothing each of our five senses. So often we try to self-soothe through binge eating, but this often has unhelpful consequences. So here are some ways to self-soothe using your senses. So your first sense that we'll talk about is vision. So you could, to self-soothe, walk in a pretty part of town, and look at the nature around you. Um, there's tons of other examples that you could use here, like uh, looking at uh, photos that make you happy or anything else. And then hearing. So listening to beautiful or soothing music. When you're listening, be mindful, letting the sounds come and go. Smell. So walk in the garden or in the woods maybe just after the rain, and breathe in the smells of nature. 
light a scented candle or incense. And taste, drink a soothing drink like herbal tea or hot chocolate. Let the taste run over your tongue and slowly down your throat. So bringing back that mindfulness that uh, Betty walked us through. And then touch, so taking a bubble bath or petting your cat or dog. So you'll notice that some of these combine different elements. So for example, you know, walking in nature, um, you get smell, you get sight, you may have the sounds of the rain. So if you can combine them, even better. You definitely don't need to try to isolate each one of the senses. And so you probably already engage in self-soothing with your five senses some of the time, or you may use some of these to help care for others. So what types of helpful self-soothing are you doing already? Are there things that you already do for yourself or that you do for others when they're not feeling well that you can uh, take and use to soothe yourself when you're not feeling well or when there is an uncomfortable emotion coming up for you? How can you use mindfulness to increase the benefits of self-soothing? So uh, again, using the same type of exercise of paying attention on purpose to the present moment uh, as you're doing these. And what other self-soothing strategies can you incorporate? Um, so there might be things that you're doing already. Maybe you're leaving out some of the five senses. Can you bring in the more of the five senses? Are there other th things that maybe you've been thinking about that you haven't tried yet? And again, as I talked about before, can you incorporate multiple senses at once? So a walk by the ocean, you get the sight and colors, hearing the waves, touch of the cool air, smell, and sometimes even the taste of the salty air. So the idea of this uh, self-soothing is to use it as an alternative to when you feel like you might want to binge eat, because we're often using binge eating to self-soothe, but Obviously, if you're listening to this webinar, you might be thinking that there's some consequences or some ways that binge eating is not helpful to you. So see if you can use self-soothing uh, instead. Practice it when you're having mildly uncomfortable feelings um, and do it often so that you can pull that in easily when you're having the urge to binge eat. Okay, and so that's the end of kind of the content in terms of teaching tools and concepts. I'm going to leave you with some mental health resources that you can use if you want to learn more about um, how to get help or learn more about binge eating disorder or binge eating. So uh, the Eastern Health website, uh, Bridge the Gap, has a full listing of mental health wellness resources. A dietitian referral can be made by your family doctor or other health professional, um, although please note that a family doctor should still be involved in your care. Um, because of some of the physical health consequences that uh, binge eating can have. Um, and you can use this um, web address to get the referral form to see a dietitian um, through Eastern Health. Counseling services um, through Eastern Health can be made through Adult Central Intake. So you can self-refer by calling 752-8888. Doorways is a walk-in counseling service, uh, and they are available without an appointment or referral. However, services are impacted by COVID-19, so please call ahead to find out what the hours are and if you need to reserve a spot. Um, and we also have a relatively new resource, which is Dial a Dietitian. So you can call 811 uh, to speak with a local dietitian today. Um, and this is available throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, and really encourage you to use this service if you are waiting on a referral to a dietitian or if you're just looking to get some extra help with the things that you learned today. Um, Fruits and Veggies Public Awareness Campaign through Eastern Health uh, will give you some more information on um, what foods to eat and how fruits and veggies can help with uh, your general well-being. And then finally, I'm going to talk about some helpful websites and other resources. So Canada's Food Guide, Jennifer mentioned uh, earlier, can be accessed through uh, this website. And hopefully you'll be able to link right through the webinar. If not, you can copy and paste. Eating Disorder Foundation of Newfoundland and Labrador. So if you think that you might have binge eating disorder or uh, some other sort of eating disorder and or you're already diagnosed, um, the Eating Disorder Foundation uh, can be really helpful in connecting you with different resources. So you can go to their website to explore that. 
uh, National Eating Disorder Information Center, uh, similar, uh, but on a national level. And then self-help books that um, we found to be useful. So Overcoming Binge Eating, second edition. Um, this is by Christopher Fairburn, who we referenced earlier uh, in the um, cycle of binge eating. Um, so this is a great resource. Compassionate Mind Guide to Ending Overeating, uh, using compassion focused therapy to overcome binging and disordered eating. And the DBT Solution for Emotional Eating. So we didn't talk about dialectical behavior therapy today, um, but this is another um, type of therapy that focuses on thoughts and behavior, similar to acceptance and commitment therapy and um, CBT as well, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that um, we found to be really useful. And that is the end of the show. Thanks for listening today.